five volts there, all good. We good? Yes. For such an old machine, the wiring inside it looks absolutely immaculate. <laughs> it really does though. What does it say on here? So let's mm. put some power in this and see what happens. Oh, that say, would be, that's exciting. As I the say, moment of truth. Yeah, I mean, the worst that can happen would be a bit of smoke comes up. Stand back, everyone. Well, that's good. We have whirring fans. Look, that's working as well. It's working. Oh my God. It's there. Load system disk and drive. I'm nearly crying. <laughs> I'll get some chicken there. It's there. Now, for my money, the star of the show was this, the Fairlight computer musical instrument. And all the sounds you're about to hear were created in here. The Fairlight came out of nowhere. Loaded up in a great Australian invention called the Fairlight computer. you got to see this unbelievable machine. We're at a, really a turning point in history. How can it be that Australia came up with one of hip-hop's most fundamental tools, yet it be unknown by pretty much everyone? This machine is going to change music. And it was a very fast moving time. Most of the machines were being sold to some of the most amazing, prolific and successful musicians in the world. The Fairlight was the very first time you had a fully integrated synthesizer, a sampler and a sequencer. That was a first. I know this is a monitor, but what do you need a monitor for in music? You could record your own samples in, you could then play them back but you could see it. Hello. Hello. The guys thought this was cheating. They thought sampling didn't even have a name then. They thought that was cheating. We're talking about what was one of the first emulations of instrumental sounds. I don't think that we'd be anywhere musically, technologically. I would go as far as to say culturally as well without the development of the Fairlight and the Quasar. The story of the Fairlight CMI, or a version of the story of the Fairlight CMI, has been told over and over again. As the years have gone by, the story that gets told becomes more nostalgic. And that's natural, but it's also problematic because what happens is, is that some aspects of the Fairlight get sort of elevated above other aspects. And it usually follows a very common narrative arc in that Peter Vogel and Kim Ryrie invented the machine. It was named Fairlight after a hydrofoil that was seen sailing across Sydney Harbour. The machine was taken to the UK. Peter Gabriel took it up. So did Kate Bush. And then it all kind of fell in a heap at the end of the 1980s. But there's a far bigger story that happens before Peter Vogel and Kim Ryrie, and that is around the Quasar. The history of the Fairlight and the Quasar and the ANU School of Music is huge. Well, the Quasar was a computer music instrument, which we can think of as a proto Fairlight CMI, but it was its own machine. It was its own invention and it stood alone as an absolute gargantuan leap in terms of computer music instrument technological development. Canberra really was the hub of that very early digital synthesizer development history. In fact, our school was the hub of all of that activity. The Quasar was designed and invented by Tony First and his own company, Creative Strategies, who were based in Sydney at the turn of the 1970s. Tony was a computer engineer and he worked for Motorola. What Tony was doing was 
uh, quite revolutionary. Uh, he had started off as a consultant for Motorola, who made the actually the computer chips. What he managed to do was to actually use two of these chips and then sort of work them in tandem and use them on alternate sort of clock cycles. So basically, they were even faster than a normal 6809. Tony is an exceedingly talented, you know, hardware designer. So he made this little sort of platform, which he called the Quasar. In his words, he operated on cottage labour and was aiming to build a computer-based digital synthesizer. There were a couple of versions. There was the Quasar and the Quasar M2, and then there was the Quasar P8. By the time he got to the Quasar M8, he was in regular communications with a composer, an Australian composer by the name of Don Banks, and Don founded the computer music and composition department, I suppose, is what it was back then. And the Quasar was very much at the center of the provision in that computer music department. And Don, I think, was its biggest champion. In the early days of the Quasar, Don's role was, was simultaneously one of composer, but he was a lot more than that. I would go as far as to say he was um, a beta tester. I think the fact that Tony had people here, and particularly Don Banks, who were giving him such quick feedback and really championing this machine, they were writing to uh, synthesizer manufacturers in the US and in the UK saying you are never going to believe what's happening here but this machine is going to change music you know it, it's being done it's being done here in Sydney and it's being done in Canberra He also gave Tony opportunities to spotlight the machine and to present the machine as an instrument that could be realistically performed with. Because at the time, a lot of analog synthesizers, yes, they were in university departments and they were part of art music composition, but they weren't particularly practical as performance-based instruments, you know. So one example of that is the building that we're actually in now was unveiled in September 1976. For two nights during the unveiling of this building, um, there was a series of concerts, a kind of like a grand opening, if you like. And on the conference program, you can see how Don Banks and members of staff and students in the computer music and composition department are performing with the Quasar, with the M8. What the Quasar did was put computer-based music production in the hands of people in university departments and so on. And so from a research perspective, that sort of set the tone then for what was possible on an industry perspective. I think Tony First is the unsung hero in this story. I think that what he was able to achieve in what was quite a short period of time was absolutely groundbreaking. The Quasar M8, that actually featured the light pen. And it was this combination of the mainframe computer to include the floppy disk drives, the monitor and the synthesizer and the light pen that formed the basis of what we know is the Fairlight CMI. So Peter Vogel and Kim Ryrie licensed Tony Furse's Quasar in order to then add the sampling capability, expand the sound library, and there were some more features as well to then create the Fairlight. I remember being given a tour of the school and us going through the basement, and I remember walking in there and in amongst all the hi-fi equipment and, you know, busted cassette recorders and things like that, there was a fair light and I thought wow that's a fair light and there was uh, a large piece of paper that had been sellotaped to the mainframe computer that said warning do not switch this off <laughs>
they're not designed to be switched off. They're designed to be operational, to have that current flowing through it, to, to make the sounds that they make, um, to be used for what they were designed to be used for. And I thought, well, I have no idea if a broken Fairlight can be fixed and whether that's possible, but I thought if anybody can do it, then Peter can do it. It's 04, so that's March 1980. Wow. And also the very fact that it's got these cannon yeah. mains on it dates it as a very early machine. All of these things were handmade, <laughs> literally yeah. down the road in Ruskovers Bay. Yeah. So this tubing was, is, is used for shelving and stuff. Mm. You know, the boards were hand soldered and yeah. plugged in, which is why, well, sorry, one of the reasons why they were just so humongously expensive. I mean, yeah. that would have cost $28,000 in 1978. And this house would probably have cost less than less that. Less than that, yeah. Peter Wilk really is the go-to engineer for all things Fairlight. And there's not a lot he doesn't know about the Fairlight. And so I was absolutely delighted when he said he would take a look at our machine. I worked for Fairlight through most of the 1980s. You know, this is you know part of my career motivation, whatever, but I just seem to have de facto managed to sort of find myself as sort of like the Fairlight person. <laughs> Not only myself, but a good proportion of the people that work there knew it was actually a very special place and a very special point in time. When you'd hear a, a track, you know, like The Art of Noise doing beatbox, which is basically all done on a, on a Fairlight 2X. And you go to even sort of like sort of guys that were, you know, soldering the things together and sort of say, guys, this is what you just made, you know, and there'd be, every, everyone would be vibed up. So I'll just try another one. You could hear it whirring away. You could hear the cogs turning. I think, um, I think I heard a faint whisper of take me back to 1983. <laughs> This is amazing. I didn't expect it to just fire up like that. Well, built to last. Yep, there and it there's is. There's our classic. Isn't it beautiful? So the entire system contents has come up. The legendary page R, the page D, the whole lot. You could be making a hit record within days. To my knowledge, it hasn't been switched on since the 90s, so and here it is, fully functional, operational. I mean, some of the sounds in just in this demo file are I iconic. Here we go. And as you can hear, it's just so, I mean, it's got that, that kind of classic art of noise sound to it. Instant 1980s. The most innovative thing about the Fairlight was almost the combination and the synthesis, for want of a better word, of all of its individual innovations. You've got digital synthesis, you've got digital sampling, you've got sequencing, you've got the ability to see and manipulate sound on a screen. You could never do that before. And so it's the amalgamation of all of these, what was then really innovative functions and features that is what made the Fairlight really special. Sampling a natural sound into the Fairlight is quick and easy. You're not just hearing one sound, you're hearing possibilities. In the beginning, there was no real competition, which is why they were successful because you couldn't go anywhere else. Um, and that's also what sparked the demise of, of uh, Fairlight is when you could go somewhere else. In the history of electronic music, I'd say the Fairlight CMI represents a major shift in technological development. You know, it's an incredibly musical machine. And I know that might sound like an obvious thing to say, but not all music technologies are musical. And in fact, since they have been uh, more designed nowadays by computer engineers, um, they've, they've arguably become less musical. When you have a great instrument with a great interface, it draws you in and you want to play with it. 
it still has a very uh, unique place. There is still something extremely sort of funky and organic about the way the Fairlight works. If it wasn't for the Fairlight, we wouldn't be where we are now. This is, of course, an incredible innovation. It pioneered digital music technology in the 1970s and through the 1980s. And for a long time, there was barely anything in the world to touch it. But there are lots of different stories that could be told. There were lots of people involved in the building and the development of the Fairlight CMI that we don't hear about. There were lots of people, including Tony First, including people like Don Banks, who were there before the Fairlight was the Fairlight. Operating something like this, like a Fairlight, gives you a huge appreciation of not only where we're at now with things like Pro Tools and Ableton and all of those digital audio workstations where you can do any, literally anything you want with any sound you could possibly create, but that all came from somewhere and it all started here. Mm -hmm.